Hello, I'm Dr. Michael Hollick, and it's a real pleasure for me to be here today to talk about vitamin D. I'm grateful to Dr. Professor Spitz for putting together this excellent symposium and the opportunity to speak to you today about the delightful vitamin D for the COVID-19 pandemic. It's very appropriate. You know, I think that vitamin D probably could be considered the nutrient, at least for the past three decades, uh, for all of its health benefits. And it has a special uh, importance um, for this pandemic. And what I'm gonna be doing today is to give you an overview about vitamin D and its health benefits from a historical perspective. So Professor Spitz basically asked me to discuss the health benefits, not only of vitamin D, but of sunlight, because of course, sunlight and vitamin D go hand in hand. But of course, we know that vitamin D has some negative consequences, no question about it. And so the pros, of course, are making vitamin D, helping in T-cell regulation, but also can cause DNA damage and increased risk uh, for skin cancer, especially non melanoma skin cancer. So how do you use them uh, in an effective way? And so it turns out actinotin um, in 1350 BC had appreciated the beneficial effect, the health benefits of sun exposure. It was Hippocrates who had prescribed heliotherapy, sunbathing for both medical and physiological purposes. And for the Olympics, um, Philosophus showed and suggested that uh, athletes should be sunbathing to strengthen their muscles and bones. We've always known that infants and children with rickets, right, when they begin to walk, had proximal muscle weakness. Have you ever wondered about Superman, where he got his strength from? You have a vitamin D receptor in your skeletal muscle. And can vitamin D improve muscle strength? I went on the internet to look up Professor Spitz when he was a youngster, and he even appreciated back then that vitamin D is critically important for muscle function. The story for vitamin D and sunlight really begins in the Industrial Revolution in the 1600s in Glasgow, Scotland, where these children in these alleyways never exposed to any sunlight developed classic rickets, the growth retardation and these skeletal abnormalities. It was a Polish physician scientist, Niedecki, in 1822 who realized something, that children living in Warsaw had a high incidence of the disease, whereas children living in rural areas didn't. And so he made an association with rickets and sunlight and concluded was strong and obvious the influence of sun on the cure of rickets. Now, who's gonna believe a Polish physician, especially in 1822? In 1889 in Boston, 80% of infants had evidence for rickets. This was also true throughout um, most of Europe. It was Holchinsky in 1919 who realized if you exposed children with rickets to radiation from a mercury arc lamp, it was effective in treating rickets. Now you have to wonder, how can you get your hands on those x-rays? Well, there's only one place to go, of course, eBay. And so I was able to get some of the earliest prints. Here's a child being exposed with the classic rickettic uh, bone abnormality. And this shows very nicely here, October 1, 1918, no mineralization of the carpal bones and very poor mineralization of the growth plates and very poor mineralization of both the radius and ulna. And look at this, November. So just a little over a month, six weeks, twice a week exposed to ultraviolet radiation, dramatic increase in the bone mineral density as the darkness area shows. And you can even see now mineralization of the carpals. 100 years ago, it was appreciated finally that sunlight was important for preventing rickets. It was Heston Unger who took children with rickets, put them on a roof of the York City Hospital, irradiating for varying periods of time depending upon their skin sensitivity and demonstrated that they could cure rickets. 
1931, the U.S. government actually sent out this brochure, Sunlight for Babies, Give Your Baby a Coat of Tan. It's important for their health. 1931, right? In 1939, by that time, hospitals had routinely been exposing patients with various chronic illnesses to ultraviolet radiation. It was Harry Steenbach in the 1920s who realized if you can radiate people and animals, why not irradiate their food? Because he realized cows don't put vitamin D in their milk. And so sure enough, irradiated vitamin D milk, the magic of vitamin D, he added ergosterol, the precursor of vitamin D2 to milk, irradiated it, and it had anti-rickettic activity. And as a result, it essentially eradicated rickets. And this process of fortification became worldwide in terms of efficacy in reducing incidence of rickets, including in Europe. And in fact, yeast was now, uh, which contains ergosterol, was irradiated. And therefore, if you made bread with irradiated yeast, you had vitamin D. And they cleverly had uh, marketed on bread by saying, if you didn't want your kids naked outside every day, have your kids eat fortified vitamin D bond bread. So do you know why vitamin D is so regulated and considered so potentially toxic and why most European countries, most countries in Asia and South America, for most of the world, does not permit food fortification of vitamin D? Is it true that Europe never fortified food with vitamin D? It turns out not true. Back in the 1930s, everything was fortified with vitamin D. It was considered to be the miracle vitamin. Here, bird's custard was fortified with vitamin D here in the United Kingdom before 1950. Hot dogs fortified with vitamin D. Soap, even um, shaving cream, all was fortified with vitamin D. But in 1950, early 1950s, a few infants presented in England with high blood calcium, funny looking faces, mental retardation, and supervalvular aortic stenosis. Well, the moms who had these infants were very concerned, and they went um, to uh, their legislators saying, you need to do something. And so they brought in the experts because it was great hysteria. And the experts found in the literature that if you give pregnant rats high doses of vitamin D, that they have high blood calcium, funny altered faces, and heart problems. Couldn't tell if they were mentally retarded, right? Turns out the, they concluded based on that alone that the outbreak of these infants with these problems was due to overfortification of milk because they had no way of equal, carefully measuring the vitamin D content. And so as a result, what do they do? Just like we do today in our society to cancel society, they banned all fortification of vitamin D throughout Europe, and then it spread throughout the world, except the United States, Canada, and a few other countries. Turns out likely those infants had Williams syndrome. It's a rare genetic disorder. And look, they have funny looking faces. They have supervalvular aortic stenosis. They have mild mental retardation, and they have a hypersensitivity to vitamin D that causes hypercalcemia. Now, I've been um, actually um, to um, the UK and had talked to the um, health um, providers as well as health care officials trying to convince them that because of this, that they should really begin to think about fortification of food again. However, it's still banned in most European countries and most Asia and even South America. Back in the 1930s, they patented this because mommy, will I make enough vitamin D? But now in this day and age, everybody worries about skin cancer. In fact, no question for more than 40 years, the dermatology societies have been saying, you should never be exposed to one direct ray of sunlight without sun protection. In fact, if you ever put your child outside without a sunscreen, right, you could wind up on America's most wanted for child abuse. Vitamin D is a sunshine vitamin. Whether you're an amphibian or reptile or avian species, lower primate, our hunter-gatherers outside every day making vitamin D. But what about these dark, hairy Neanderthals? Were they making vitamin D? Not likely, right? And it turns out that finally their DNA actually revealed that they had a melanocyte receptor mutation. 
that caused them to have red hair and fair complexion, perfect for their environment to make vitamin D. And so why did they lose their pigment? Why did they need to make vitamin D? This is the reason, likely, right? Here's the pelvis of a healthy female. Here's the pelvis of a female that had infantile rickets. She had a very flat and poorly deformed with very small pelvic outlet, making it very difficult, if not impossible, for childbirthing. So pigmentation had to devolve very quickly, disappear in order for procreation to have been effective as people migrated north and south of the equator. Now, I thought we could go with my daughter to Kenya and make some vitamin D in the winter since we can't make any in Boston and I could write it off on our taxes and medical expense. It doesn't work, but you can make vitamin D year round at the equator. This Sambur warrior, perfectly designed for his environment. So how do you compare and contrast? So I figured, no question that my gene pigment devolved, right? Mutated in order for me to make enough vitamin D in far northern and, lati and southern latitudes. So sunlight exudes energy. We know that. How do you make vitamin D in your skin? It turns out it's the precursor of cholesterol, 70 hundred cholesterol, absorbs ultraviolet radiation, actually converting it to pre-D. And in the plasma membrane of your skin cell, rapidly converts by a temperature dependent process to vitamin D3, and then leaves the skin and enters the circulation. Now, this woman has a lot of problems, but one thing she doesn't have to worry about, you will never become intoxicated from exposure to sunlight because any excess is destroyed by the sun. In fact, I'm always asked, is it any better to be ingesting vitamin D or getting exposed to sunlight? Is there any difference? And it turns out that you can't become toxic from exposure to sunlight, and that when you're exposed to sunlight, it lasts two to three times longer, right? And here are the data, which we showed that here exposed to simulated sunlight, the vitamin D levels continue um, to be um, at, at a much higher level than taking it orally. Lasts at least two to three times longer in your blood. How much? Well, you never wanna burn. And you can't look like this, right? And if you live in New England, you don't wanna look like that. But you know, early in evolution, we know exactly how long to go outside to stay in the sun and then to go into the shade so you didn't get a sunburn. But we lost that sensitivity about 10,000 years ago. So we did a study, right? And I carefully reviewed the literature. And here it says, how do you know when you make enough vitamin D? So these little poppies just pop your belly button. That doesn't happen anymore. So we did another study, right? We took healthy adults were vitamin D deficient or insufficient, exposed them to simulated sunlight, and then later on gave an oral dose of vitamin D to see how they relate. And we showed that it's equivalent, one minimal erythemal dose, equivalent to 20,000 international units of vitamin D taken orally. Does sunlight provide you with your vitamin D requirement? No matter what your ethnicity, here a very nice study done in Denmark by Dr. Brat showed the peak levels are always at the end of the summer, the nadir at the end of the winter. What about aging, right? Do you, should you be having elders be exposed to sunlight? Turns out Mr. Burns worried about this. And so we did a study and showed that yes, if you compare a 20 year old to a 70 year old, about a 75% reduction because the amount of 70 hydrocholesterol decreases with age. So the question is, can you make any at all? Well, Burns was worried about that, right? And so we did a study and Dr. Ian Reed had done a similar study, took elders, put them out on a veranda and exposed them to sunlight and showed that after 30 or 15 minutes that you can raise the blood levels of 25 hydroxy vitamin D, exposing arms and legs a couple of times a week between about the hours of 10 and uh, 3 p.m. And so what about the sun? Right? It's amazing when you think about this, that only about 0.1% UVB ever reaches the Earth's surface, about 5% UVA. Most of it, in fact, is visible and infrared radiation. And the radiations responsible for making vitamin D is between 290 and 315 nanometers, this tiny amount right here. So what are the consequences of being exposed to sunlight? Are there any benefits? And so it turns out Vincent in 1897 started radiating 
um, adults with tuberculosis of the skin known as lupus vulgaris. And he had dramatic improvement. In fact, it related to him ultimately in 1903 to receive the Nobel Prize for this observation. So look at this before and then after exposure to his um, increased intensity sunlight, quite dramatic. And so why should you care about all of this? We know, of course, that once you make vitamin D in your skin, it goes to your liver and then kidneys to get activated. And we know that the vitamin D receptor exists in your intestine, bone, and kidneys to regulate calcium metabolism. But the light turned on back in the 1990s when we began to realize that essentially every tissue and cell in your body has a vitamin D receptor. Why would they be there if they weren't having an effect? And so indeed, it was Dr. Suda that gave us the first insight. He took pre these leukemic cells that had a vitamin D receptor, incubated them with active vitamin D, and showed that they became normal. So what about vitamin D and the cancer connection? There is a lot of evidence linking sunlight deficiency with increased risk. Indeed, as early as 1915, when they looked at Navy personnel working indoors, they had eight times higher risk of dying compared to Navy personnel outdoors exposed to sunlight. Sunbathing can risk, cut your risk of cancer, right? 1941, Apperly showed, if you live in Northern United States like Massachusetts, New Hampshire, you had a much higher cancer mortality compared to living down South. The Garland brothers began to show higher risk of mortality from colon cancer if you live in the Northeast compared to living down in Southern states. What about autoimmune diseases? Curiously, you have a 50 to 60 fold higher risk of having multiple sclerosis if you live at higher latitudes compared to being born and living at the equator. It's known that if you're born and live for the first 10 years of your life above 35 degrees north latitude, you have 100% increased risk of developing multiple sclerosis for the rest of your life, no matter where you live in the world. Also, a study done out of Harvard showed from the Nurses Health Study, women taking the highest amount of vitamin D reduced risk of MS 41%. And here are the data looking at serum concentrations of 25 hydroxy D and the uh, um, exacerbation rate, right? So if you have multiple sclerosis and your vitamin D is sufficient, you have higher relapse risk if you're vitamin D deficient compared to being vitamin D sufficient. So lower risk. Also, the Lucas group showed very nicely UVB radiation of mice that have a um, model of encephalitis similar to multiple sclerosis is very effective in helping reducing the inflammatory activity similar to giving active vitamin D, but much better than giving high doses of vitamin D. And also for type one diabetes, again, 10 to 15 fold higher risk if you live at higher latitudes compared to living at the equator. Exposure to sunshine early in life prevented the development of type 1 diabetes in Danish boys. And the study showed, and this is over a large number of um, children um, by age of 15 years, sunshine during the third trimester, right, showed marked decrease in hazard risk ratio. 40% reduction if the pregnant mom was exposed to sunlight, at least during her third um, trimester. What about blood pressure and hypertension? And what about cardiovascular disease? We know now that the higher um, risk for uh, cardiovascular mortality occurs in the wintertime and is least in the summertime, and on average 24 to 39%. Cholesterol levels are much lower in the summertime than they are in the wintertime. Your blood pressure is definitely moving um, in a direction where it's much higher in the wintertime compared to the summertime. 
And also was scan showed very nicely, looking at latitude and blood pressure, both systolic and diastolic blood pressure. The higher the distance from the equator, higher were your blood pressures in both systolic and diastolic. And so what about any benefit of vitamin D for any pandemic, including the influenza pandemics? And so we know, of course, that the pandemic today for um, COVID is pretty serious. And in fact, here the Daily Mail suggests that vitamin D may be a new hope on the war of the coronavirus. But now let's go back to history. In 1849, it was appreciated that if you gave tuberculosis patients cholera oil, they did better. Florence Nightingale appreciated that if you exposed patients through uh, windows, not with glass, but through windows without glass, because glass absorbs the vitamin D producing rays. You can't make vitamin D if you're exposed to of sunlight through glass. She recognized that direct sunlight was necessary for a speedy recovery. Vitamin D protects against TB. It's also known that if you live above about um, 5,000 um, meters um, altitude, you essentially will not obtain, you will not uh, wind up being infected with tuberculosis. And then often TB patients were put at higher altitudes here in Switzerland, specifically for treatment of TB. And so what about vitamin D and the 1918 pandemic? A study was done in Boston, which was curious, open air treatment for pandemic. And it was shown at Camp Brooks, open air hospital in Boston, that the pandemic fared better for those that were exposed to direct sunlight and saved their lives during this historic outbreak. Direct sunlight when available, notice severely ill patients improved much better than those kept indoors. Here, Grant and Giovannucci showed very nicely the pandemic of 1918-19 of influenza. If you look in the Northern versus Southern states in terms of numbers of cases, morbidity and mortality, much higher in Northern states because there's much lower UV actually coming in because of um, sunlight being um, less intense in uh, Northern latitudes. So what about influenza, solar radiation and vitamin D? Dr. Moen and Astra um, did a very nice study back in, 2011 gave a presentation realizing that this virus is going through the nasal cavity into your lungs and having a lot of serious consequences. COVID does the same thing and has exactly many of the same consequences. So what about the flu and season? So it turns out that it always occurs in the wintertime and Hope Simpson had suggested that there's a seasonal stimulus. And he went on to publish the paper to show that if you live at the equator, you're less likely to develop influenza and mainly occur during rainy seasons when sunlight was less intense. But if you lived above and below the equator, 30 degrees, you had a much higher risk and it always occurred in the wintertime. And so tropical countries always occurred sporadically but in temperate regions, winter. And so also he looked at the uh, incidents in the wintertime of various uh, outbreaks of influenza and showed over and over and over again, always occurs in the wintertime. He did a study in Norway and showed very nicely, if you look at the number of deaths due to influenza, very high here, January, February, March, and November, December, and January, look at 25 hydroxy vitamin D levels. They're at their lowest. And in the summertime, hardly any deaths. And the 25 hydroxy vitamin D levels are at their highest at around 70 to 80 nanograms, I'm sorry, 70 to 80 nanomoles per liter, translating to about 30 to 40 nanograms per ml. The peak flu season occurs in the wintertime. And that's at the time when the 25-hydroxy vitamin D is at its nadir. 
And so there has been data from the National Health Survey associating vitamin D status and upper respiratory tract infections. Indeed, less than 10 nanograms per ml versus greater than 30, looking in the winter, spring, summer, and fall, didn't matter. If your blood levels were above 30, you had a lower risk of upper respiratory tract infections. This is consistent with the study um, done by Sabetta um, at Yale, where he showed serum 25-hydroxy vitamin D levels in healthy adults. Those that had a blood level on average of 38 nanograms per ml, you would have to be exposed to some sunlight and probably taking three to 5,000 units of vitamin D a day to attain this level. Reduced risk of upper respiratory tract infections twofold. A study done in Japan in school children in the wintertime that got either placebo or 1,200 units of vitamin D a day. Those that got 1,200 units of vitamin D a day reduced risk of influenza A infection 42%. They also looked at asthma incidents and showed a more than 90% reduced risk of having an asthma attack if for those that were on the 1,200 units of vitamin D a day. Also, um, Dr. Aloya many years ago showed in postmenopausal African-American women, right, at high risk of vitamin D deficiency, right, receiving 50 micrograms, 2,000 units a day, right, in the wintertime, reduced cold influenza infections by 80%. So what is the effect of vitamin D on the immune system? We know inactivated T cells have no vitamin D receptor. You activate them and they do. Why? Simply because 125-dihydroxy vitamin D made locally, right, is regulating proliferation as well as cytokine production. Inactivated B cells have no receptor. You activate them and they do. And what does it do? It regulates immunoglobulin synthesis, likely modulating it, reducing production of autoantibodies, reducing risk for autoimmune disorders. Activated macrophages, as you know, activate vitamin D. Do you know why? Now know why, right? Here, toll-like receptors triggering an antimicrobial response. Adams, Maudlin, and Liu showed very nicely. You infect the uh, macrophage with TB, right? First thing that gets turned on toll-like receptors, what is it doing? Signaling the cell to increase expression of 1-hydroxylase. 25-hydroxy D in the circulation entering the cell is converted to 125-dihydroxy vitamin D, which then tells the nucleus to unlock genetic information, increasing expression of catholicidin, a defense in protein that specifically kills infectious agents. Indeed, what is the evidence that vitamin D can improve immune health? So we did a study in healthy adults in Boston who were vitamin D deficient or insufficient and looked at gene expression of their white blood cells. And we did this for 12 weeks on 2000 units of vitamin D a day. Chip analysis of almost 23,000 genes. All of these blue lines are underexpressed genes and all of these orange and red are overexpressed. After vitamin D, 291 genes, all of these were Increased expression, all of these were decreased in their expression. So now the next question is, how much vitamin D do you need to do this regulation? And if you increase your vitamin D intake, can you see a significant difference in gene expression? And so we did a study and we did this to see if there's a dissociation of vitamin D's calcemic activity versus its effect on immune response. And the way we did this was we took healthy adults that were deficient or insufficient and gave them either 600, 4,000, or 10,000 units a day for half a year. And we showed very nicely, they started out between 17 and 22 nanograms per ml. 25 hydroxy vitamin D levels increased dramatically the higher the vitamin D dose. 
We showed very nicely that if you're looking at 25 hydroxy D on 600 units a day, maintaining it, barely increasing it, PTH levels, no change. 4,000 units a day, nice decline in PTH, increase in 25 hydroxy D. On 10,000 units a day, 25 hydroxy D dramatically increased. And the PTH levels decreased, but about to the same degree as on 4,000 units a day. And so therefore, the maximum benefit on calcium metabolism, we believe, is in the range of 4,000 units a day. But what about on 10,000 units a day? Does it have any effect on gene expression? And so we've looked at this. And so all, again, all of these blue lines, right, are underexpressed, red are overexpressed. So these are going from underexpressed to increased expressed, increased expressed to decreased expressed. On 600 units a day, right, we showed about 128 genes being affected. 4,000 units a day. Look at all these increased lines. All of these are now being turned on. All of these are being turned off. And we could show about twice as many genes on 4,000 units are being regulated. 10,000 units a day. Look at all of these lines. All of these genes that are turned off are now being turned on robustly. On, robustly turned off. Same, same. And we've got to see a little bit less response for others. But looking at the blood levels, right? 25 hydroxy D, 20 versus 56, 21 up to 87, 23 up to 96, 14 up to 84, right? So this Karsten says, do you see what I see in this data, right? He had been doing in vitro studies showing in immune cells incubated with 125D that some people had very good response and others had a marginal or essentially no response. So even with the same amount of active vitamin D, different people responded differently. And sure enough, when we look at our data, these are very robust responders, but these are less robust, even though their 25 hydroxy vitamin D levels, in fact, were even higher. So it demonstrates that you can't predict who is going to respond as well to vitamin D. And this could explain a lot of the variability we see in RCTs because you don't expect to see everybody responding in the same way. And so this demonstrates even though the blood levels increase to the same degree, right? Some with a robust genomic response, others with a weak response, right? That there was a dissociation. And so again, look at this, 400, I'm sorry, 600, versus 4,000, versus 10,000, look at the step up in gene expression in your immune system. And so what is it affecting? We looked at the pathways for DNA repair, apoptosis, oxidative stress, metabolic processes, and anti-inflammatory activity. This is an interesting study. A dermatologist had a child with ichthyosis, a rare genetic disorder, and he, the child had rickets. So he asked a colleague, how do you treat rickets? And the colleague said, 60,000 units once a week for 10 weeks. The dermatologist misheard him and gave 60,000 units a day for 10 days, 600,000 units to this child in 10 days. That's the child. The child had no toxicity, but had a dramatic improvement in the ichthyosis. So now what about COVID? Can vitamin D help in this pandemic? And so we know, of course, that 125-dihydroxy vitamin D plays a role in innate and adaptive immunity and regulates cytokine production. And since the cytokine storm is playing such an important role in morbidity and mortality, the question is, can improvement in vitamin D status have some impact? And so we know that dendritic macrophages and your activated TB lymphocytes all respond to vitamin D through its 125D, decreasing uh, cytokines that are potentially damaging and increasing cytokines that are potentially helpful. We also know that this virus cleverly gets into the cells through the ACE2 receptor and vitamin D plays a critical role in the ACE system. And so all of these are nice theories, but where is the evidence? And so working with Quest Diagnostics, who was doing positivity rates uh, throughout the entire United States, millions of people, we looked at 
the relationship of COVID positivity in over 190,000 patients throughout the entire United States for all ethnicities, ages, as well as uh, latitudes. And we showed in this 191,000 patient population, if they were at 20 compared to at 34, a 54% reduced risk of being infected. And that continued benefit after 60 nanograms per ml. What about for African-Americans? There's no question. They're more likely to be more vitamin D deficient. They have a higher positivity rate, but if they had a higher 25-hydroxy vitamin D, they had a lower risk of infection. Also aging, no difference. Improvement in vitamin D status, whether you're above or below 60 years of age, had the same benefit, higher 25-hydroxy vitamin D, lower risk of infectivity. But will it improve health outcomes? That's the next question. So we did a study with Dr. Magabuli in Iran, and we looked at 235 patients, 74% had severe disease when they entered the hospital. And we asked the question. We measured their blood level at the time they entered the hospital and looked at severity, unconsciousness, hypoxia, C-reactive protein, and lymphocyte count. They were all positive related for those that were vitamin D sufficient. And so the, she also looked at 235 patients and the deaths and showed that there were no deaths under the age of 40, but those over the age of 40, if they had a 25 hydroxy vitamin D of at least 30 nanograms per ml, reduce risk of dying by 51.5%. We did a study at our hospital looking at the association of hospital morbidity and mortality and 25 hydroxy vitamin D in COVID and showed in 287 patients, right? That if they were vitamin D sufficient, 25 hydroxy D of greater than 30 nanograms per ml and normal weight, they had a marked reduction in morbidity and mortality. There was no benefit if they were obese. And so we think that 125D made locally by macrophages is regulating a whole variety of immune responses, reducing risk for uh, acute uh, respiratory uh, distress, as well as kidney injury um, and helping to improve the overall health of the patient. We got a lot of publicity for that um, for good reason. And so, is there any benefit to improving lymphocytes and decreasing neutrophils for clinical outcomes, right? We showed very nicely um, that the lymphocyte neutrophil count increased and, and that the neutrophil ratio um, um, to uh, lymphocyte decreased or the lymphocyte to uh, neutrophil ratio increased. And so we looked at, and, at our data from our 600, 4,000 and 10,000 unit data and expression analysis, and then looked at the literature to see whether or not there were genes that were being found in COVID patients and how they may relate. And so, like I said, we had patients for six months on all of these and we did expression analysis. And then what we did, looked at the literature and we looked at 23 publications selected to and 64 genes seem to be associated with what we found in our vitamin D study and others found in their COVID studies. And of all of those genes, folate receptor three genes stood out related to vitamin D supplementation and COVID infectivity and morbidity and mortality. And so what is folate receptor three, right? It turns out that it's important and it's part of the innate immune response of granules. And it's been hypothesized that after secretion, it binds folate and then deprives microbes and other cells of folate, therefore decreasing their ability to be able to multiply. And so by having the neutrophil release the folate receptor, binding folate um, has this effect. So we asked the question, if you look at ICU and um, patients versus non-ICU patients, that there is a significant uh, expression of the folate receptor three gene. 
on the six month study that we looked at, look at this, 100% reduction on 600 units, 170% reduction on 4,000 units, 270% reduction on 10,000 units a day. So those that had severe outcomes had much higher expression and on higher doses of vitamin D, much lower expression. So the effect of neutrophil lymphocyte ratio on COVID morbidity and mortality, the thinking is that if you have higher neutrophils releasing this factor, this receptor is binding folate and therefore decreasing the ability of the body to fight this infection. And so COVID severity and mortality is associated with high neutrophil um, ratio compared to lymphocytes. So if you increase 25-hydroxy vitamin D, right, you can improve the lymphocyte um, ratio uh, to neutrophils. So you decrease the folate 3 receptor expression in the blood, reduce risk of severe COVID-19 infection. And this is what's happening. We know 125D binds its receptor and there's good evidence that through that binding that it's decreasing the folate receptor expression. And so increased folate three receptor expression is involved in tissue damage, no question. And if you increase expression and now give vitamin D and improve 25-hydroxy vitamin D levels, now you have more folate available because 125D decreases the folate uh, receptor 3 gene. And as a result, you now improve the health of the immune system and less vascular damage and organ damage and acute respiratory distress. What about vitamin D supplementation and other diseases related to folate 3? Uh, receptor expression. There's good evidence that autoimmune disorders, coronary artery disease, cancers, and Alzheimer's disease have all been related to this re ex increased expression of the folate receptor gene. And so it could be that some way that by 125D downregulating it will help improve many of these chronic illnesses or reduce their risk. Conclusion, right? suggests that the folate 3 receptor gene overexpressed in severe COVID patients may be related to vitamin D supplementation's effect in reducing risk of subvertity and mortality. Previous literature suggests potentially through reducing neutrophil lymphocyte ratio and tissue, tissue damage. So will vitamin D improve immune response? You know, we don't really know whether that might or might not be true but let there be light, the role of vitamin D on immune and vaccines. There's been some evidence to suggest that indeed, in these cancer patients at least, that the higher the blood level, uh, more of a response um, to the immunization if your blood level of 25-hydroxy-D was at least 30 nanograms per ml. Here, impact of vitamin D supplementation on influenza response. There's good evidence to suggest that it does in fact improve the um, vaccination um, activity in terms of cytokine production, um, et cetera. So get vaccinated and take vitamin D. It modulates and improves immune function. A study is underway right now that I'm participating in in India asking this question. If you improve vitamin D status and you're immunized, will it boost your immune system? We don't know the answer to that, but hopefully in the next six months or so, we will get, have some better data on it. So how do you treat vitamin D deficiency? When you go to your gas station, do you get a gallon or a liter of gas? No. So in the United States, we have 50,000 units, 6,500 units basically a day that I give 50,000 units once a week for eight weeks. And then when they're sufficient, I put them on 50,000 units every two weeks, equivalent to 3,000 units a day. And so the question, of course, is that's great for a couple of months, but what about year after year? Do you have to worry about the building up in your body fat and causing toxicity? And so we did a study and showed after six years on 50,000 units a day, equivalent to 3,300 units a day, no toxicity, blood levels in the range of 40 to 60 nanograms per ml. We also showed 1,000 units a day to healthy adults that are vitamin D deficient, 
you will not become sufficient. So can you give it twice a month without screening? Because that's one of the worries, right? You don't always have the 25-hydroxy-D available uh, as an assay for you. And so it turns out we did another study and we took all comers to my clinic. We got a blood, but we didn't measure it. And we simply gave them 50,000 units once a week for eight weeks, followed by 50,000 units every two weeks for up to six years. We found out at the end that some had a baseline as much as up to 50 nanograms per ml. So what happened to them? Could they have become intoxicated by not knowing it before we gave them this dose? And so we showed very nicely, even at 50 nanograms per ml at baseline, they went up to about 80 nanograms per ml. There was no toxicity. So this amount of vitamin D as recommended by the Endocrine Society is perfectly safe to both treat and prevent vitamin D deficiency. It's basically 100,000 units a month. And so can you become toxic? No question. Hypercalcemia, hyperphosphatemia, among other consequences. And so Bob Heaney and I, we did a study many years ago and showed up to 10,000 units a day for five months was perfectly safe. No evidence of hypercalcemia. Study done in Canada showed that Canadians taking up to 20,000 units a day, their blood levels never reached above 100 nanograms per ml, no toxicity. But what about infants and children? Catherine Gordon showed very nicely, you could treat infants and children 2,000 units a day for six weeks to correct D deficiency or 50,000 units a week. It's perfectly safe. What about pregnant women? Um, Hollis and Wagner showed very nicely, pregnant women taking 4,000 units a day, maintaining a blood level of 50 nanograms per ml, no change in serum calcium or urinary calcium, no consequence, but impossible improvement in birth outcomes. You can become toxic. This poor gentleman went on the internet back in the 90s thinking he was taking 10,000, 1,000 units a, in a teaspoon and he was taking 2,000 units a day. The company forgot to dilute it. He was taking pure crystal and vitamin D, a million units a day. This will cause toxicity. Calcium of 15, 25 hydroxy D of 500. He became my patient. I told him, stop all calcium intake, all vitamin D, wear sun protection. His 25 hydroxy D gradually came down. He had no consequence from this. Hydrating him, he quickly, his calcium came back to normal. It's difficult to become vitamin D intoxicated. So adequate vitamin D is necessary from birth until death, right? No question about it, right? Amount of evidence linking it to these chronic illnesses. Think about it, disease burden and vitamin D deficiency, low birth weight, stunted growth, type two diabetes, hypertension, fracture, cancer, infectious diseases, autoimmune diseases, and now of course, COVID-19. Indeed, don't think about a normal level. You want to have a healthy level. The goal minimum should be 30 nanograms per ml, right? 75 nanomoles per liter, 40 to 60 nanograms per ml, as recommended by the Endocrine Society, is preferred. How much do you need? How much do you need to raise your blood level? Turns out that if you're wanting to know what your blood level should be, how can we determine that, right? Our hunter-gatherers outside probably gave us an insight, right, thousands of years ago. And we have still um, groups out there like the Maasai herders, right, at Hasda Warriors, where a study was done by Luxwalda and showed very nicely that they have blood levels around 40 to 50 nanograms per ml. They have perfectly designed skin for their environment you would have to take 4,000 to 5,000 units a day to achieve those levels. I guarantee you, if you're not on a vitamin D supplement, your blood levels are in this range. And for every 100 units you ingest, you raise your blood level by one, once you're in the range of about 15 to 20 nanograms per ml. That's why 1,000 units a day will not make you sufficient if you're vitamin D deficient. I typically recommend easy 2,000 units a day for adults, children, 1,000 units a day. Conquer vitamin D deficiency, best source. Sunlight, for sure. 
And I realized back in 2004, as everybody was um, talking about the negative consequences of sun exposure, never to be exposed to direct sunlight, I wrote the book, The UV Advantage. And I did not want to be controversial. And so on the first page, I said, I do not advocate tanning, but those that wish to do should do it responsibly. And I also point out, if you go in the literature, right, lifetime sun exposure increases risk of non-melanoma skin cancer. Easy to detect and easy to treat, but everybody worries about melanoma, right? And for good cause, it's one of the most deadly cancers. And so it turns out, did you know, most melanomas occur on the least sun exposed areas and occupational sun exposure actually decreases risk of malignant melanoma, right? And here are the data from um, the Dermatology Journal of Investigative Dermatology in 2003. Lifetime sun exposure appeared to lower risk for malignant melanoma. The risk factors are fair skin type, multiple sunburns, especially as a child and young adult, having a large number of moles on your body. Ancestors' view of the sun, a lot different than dermatologists' view. No question that they always tell you wear sun protection. If you put on a sunscreen properly with an SPF of 30, it will reduce your ability to make vitamin D in your skin by 97.5%. Have you ever been on rounds when an unlightened dermatologist? No question. Schultz epitomizes good common sense, right? Penis character, Linus getting note from his mom. Are you sitting in the sun? I hope so. A little sun is good. Perhaps 10 minutes a day. This time of the year is about right and don't overdo it. Moderation, that's what we need as a recommendation. Indeed, this is what's happened to our sun. It's been demonized for more than 50 years. Never be exposed to one direct ray of sunlight. Indeed, slip, slip, slip message in Australia, 40% of Australians are now vitamin D deficient, right? Who's that? Australian dermatologist on vacation, right? 87% were found to be vitamin D deficient. Right, vitamin D has been associated with schizophrenia, depression, dementia, Alzheimer's disease. We know a vitamin D receptor exists in your brain, it responds to 125D. There's evidence in animal studies that it improves serotonin levels in your brain, hence reducing risk for depression, right? A whole host of cognitive dysfunction and CNS disorders have been related to vitamin D deficiency. Also, a very interesting study that came out, vitamin D deficiency may increase opioid abuse, right? So again, vitamin D regulating serotonin levels in the brain may make you feel better, less likely to abuse opioids. What about skin cancer and sun damage, right? And so a study was done in the UK where they're very fair skinned and then they took some fair skinned adults and type four skin, darker skinned adults. And they exposed them to simulated sunlight as being in London for six weeks. And they showed uh, very nicely improvement in vitamin D status. And they took a skin biopsy to look at DNA damage, looking at the thymidine um, uh, dimers. So what they showed after six weeks of UK summer simulated sunlight, skin type two, 20 hydroxy D went from 15 to 21. Skin type five, very dark skin, eight, hardly any increase. But look at this. These dots are CPD of, in the nuclei, the DNA damage, right, at, immediately after exposure. Totally expected. So what would happen week after week? Would you increase DNA damage? They showed very nicely after six weeks, no increase in DNA damage. In fact, there's a decrease. And a Nobel Prize was given, right, many years ago to show that when you're damaging your DNA, that you increase enzymes to help to fix the DNA damage due to sun exposure. You could get it from your diet. This is what we've been taught. If you have a healthy diet, you can get all your nutrients, including vitamin D. 
I hopefully have convinced you, you cannot get enough from your diet. Indeed, the best source is sunlight, the time of day, season, latitude, degree of skin pigmentation. How's a person to know how long to be outside? And what if it's cloudy outside? So we developed an app, right, with Oncometrics. And we showed very nicely that if you use this app, dminder.info, that it will tell you anywhere on this planet, any time of the year, when you can make vitamin D, how much vitamin D you make, and it wants you to get out of the sun so you don't get a sunburn. So what do I do, right? I, like all my sun family, sun protection on face and on upper arms, on the top of the hands, but not on my arms and legs. And I take 6,000 units a day, like many of my family members. My blood level is 72 nanograms per ml. Vitamin D deficiency is probably the most common medical condition worldwide. And in fact, think about it. If any of these chronic illnesses, including COVID, could be helped by improving your vitamin D status, there is no downside to increasing your vitamin D intake, right? We don't need to be a genius to know this, right? We need sensible sun and vitamin D supplement recommendations with good food fortification programs. This is not a hypothesis, right? This is the uh, radiation from the sun that you're making your vitamin D. But we also know that sunlight has a lot of other health benefits, immune modulation, and regulating the POMC gene, beta endorphin production, people feeling better, right? ACTH production, uh, regulating autoimmunity, nitric oxide and carbon monoxide production, again, regulating uh, vascular uh, uh, effects. And so when you're thinking about sunlight, yes, vitamin D is critically important, but there are other benefits as well uh, that are occurring in the skin. Even the World Health Organization now recognizes sun beneficial effects. Yes, it's warm, it enhances general feeling of well being, but they also say a little sunlight is good for you, no doubt about it, for the production of vitamin D. I wrote a book called The Vitamin D Solution. It's in um, various formats uh, and has been translated in many languages, including Spanish and in Chinese. And it turns out, question, should you be screening everybody? Most of the world doesn't have the 25 hydroxy vitamin D assay equally available. And so the question is no to the answer, right? But if you have a high BMI, you have fat malabsorption, if you have sarcoid, a sensitivity to vitamin D, meds like glucocorticoids, anti-seizure medications, you definitely do. Endocrine Society recommends 400 to 1,000 units in infants, 600 to 1,000 in children. Teenagers should be treated like adults, 1,500 to 2,000 units a day. And if you're obese, you need two to three times more. So change your perspective, right? Merck came out with this medication, right? That would cost potentially $712 for uh, its use in reducing morbidity and mortality associated with being infected with COVID. And they said moderate and mild illness was reduced by half, 50% reduction. That's pretty impressive, right? An enlightening perspective for COVID. Think about this, right? What did I present to you? Infectivity was reduced by 54% if you're vitamin D sufficient and it improved even the blood levels were higher. And from that study in Iran by Dr. Magabuli, right? Marked reduced risk of morbidity and mortality, 50%, similar to what was reported for the Merck drug, right? Think about it. For 100 5,000 unit tablets, this is what is on the, uh, on the internet, for eight weeks would cost $12. For Merck, $712 to reduce risk of morbidity and mortality by 50%. Vitamin D can improve your health. No question that vitamin D. In terms of conflict of interest, I am a consultant for Biogena for Ontometrics, and I have a grant from Carbage and Amcus. And I thank you so much for your kind attention and have a delightful day.